The Civil War was a bloody and tragic conflict that tested the courage and skill of many military leaders. Some of them rose to the occasion and proved themselves as brilliant strategists and inspiring commanders. Others, however, failed miserably and caused unnecessary losses and suffering for their men and their cause. Today, we will explore 10 worst American Civil War generals based on their incompetence, cowardice, corruption, or cruelty. Brigadier General Gideon Pillow. When the war broke out, Tennessee Governor Isham Harris promoted Pillow to Major General in the Provisional Army of Tennessee. His first opponent on the battlefield was Ulysses S. Grant, an insignificant brigade general. Grant wrote to his sister, I'm not saying Pillow would shoot himself. I believe, however, that he would report himself wounded if he received a minor scratch. In November 1861, Grant launched a quick attack on him in Belmont, Missouri. Grant was able to deliver a devastating blow on Pillow's Confederates and escape a probable death trap. Meanwhile, Pillow did exactly the wrong thing at each phase of the battle. Gideon Pillow commanded a brigade of Tennessee soldiers on his final day of Stones River. The division commander, Major General John Breckinridge, was furious when he discovered Pillow cowering behind a tree rather than leading his soldiers. It was a gift that kept giving. Three months later, as Grant besieged Fort Donelson, Pillow shamefully agreed to the surrender of the still-resisting army to Grant, who won the priceless nickname Unconditional Surrender during the fight. Pillow usually blamed his failures on others. Major General John Pope. Pope was mocked by both his rivals and many of his own men. Lincoln sent Pope from the west to the east in the summer of 1862 to command the newly formed Army of Virginia, which was tasked with protecting Northern Virginia while General George McClellan battled on the Virginia Peninsula. Pope made exciting announcements and grandiose declarations about how he was going to change things in Virginia, which were full of self-congratulation, but showed little consideration for his opponent's military abilities. Pope believed only what he wanted to believe. This was a disastrous mistake for Pope, who was up against Lee and Jackson. The Kentuckian led his army into a trap at Second Manassas and was defeated by General Robert Lee's massive army. Lieutenant General John Bell Hood. Until 1864, Hood was considered one of the Confederacy's top division commanders. He was an excellent combat leader, and his reputation as a fighter got stronger with time. However, Hood was promoted to Lieutenant General and assigned command of the Army of Tennessee in 1864. Hood was an excellent officer at the brigade and division levels, but he had no business leading an army. Throughout the fight, Hood relied on courage and an aggressive assault to defeat the enemy. While that strategy works effectively at the brigade level, it is far less effective at the division, corps, and army levels. Hood's command of the Army of Tennessee was a complete failure. When the situation called for delicacy and maneuver, Hood launched costly frontal assaults that destroyed his army's strength and morale. He hammered himself into incapacity outside of Atlanta while ignoring his enemy's abilities. Hood then devastated his army in a series of weird and reckless frontal assaults on well-entrenched Union troops in Franklin and Nashville. His tactical ineptness, one-dimensional planning, and dull-witted instincts killed the Army of Tennessee more effectively than Union gunfire and shells. Major General Ambrose Burnside. When the Civil War broke out, Burnside created the 1st Rhode Island Infantry, which was one of the first groups to arrive in Washington and protect the capital. Burnside's failures are among the most well-known during the fight, and some regard him as one of the worst Civil War generals on both sides. He appeared to have no tactical abilities. At the Battle of Antietam in September 1862, he spent the entire day on the Union's left flank, unable to defeat Toombs' brigade with his 9th Corps. His failure is honored by the bridge on the battlefield that carries his name to this day. As commander of the Army of the Potomac at Fredericksburg in December 1862, his frontal attack on the indestructible Confederate position resulted in the pointless deaths of thousands of Yankee soldiers. 
Lieutenant General Leonidas Polk, former Bishop of Louisiana. When the war began, his connection with West Point classmate Jefferson Davis earned him a position as a Major General in the Confederate States Army. He had no military experience other than his time at West Point when he graduated eighth in a class of 38. Upon taking command, he launched an expedition to Columbus, Kentucky. Since Kentucky was technically neutral, Polk's 1861 raid prompted the state to request Northern assistance. The Confederacy lost what may have been a crucial strategic asset. He was continuously awful, making errors that cost thousands of lives and undermined the Confederate command structure in the West to the point where you could argue he was a Union spy. On June 14, 1864, in the midst of the epic fight, Polk and a small group of fellow commanders rode to the top of Pine Mountain to better analyze the Union positions in the valley underneath. Riding along the blue lines, General Sherman used a spyglass to locate the officers. He directed the guns to fire on the gathering. The first shot scattered the Confederates, while the second ripped through Polk's body. Major General Benjamin Butler. Once in New Orleans, he became the military governor and governed the city in questionable ways. During this time, he issued Order 28, stating that any lady in New Orleans who showed disrespect for Union soldiers would be treated as if she were a prostitute. He was relieved of his duties in December 1862 and assigned command of the Department of Virginia and North Carolina in November 1863, later known as the Army of the James. During the Bermuda Hundred campaign, he led this force badly, allowing Confederate commander PGT Beauregard to slow him down with a smaller force. He failed again at Fort Fisher, North Carolina, and was ordered by Union General Ulysses S. Grant to return home and await orders. Lieutenant General Theophilus Holmes. When the Civil War began, Holmes was the commander of Fort Columbus on Governor's Island in New York Harbor. He resigned his commission with the United States Army and joined the Confederate Army as a colonel. Holmes fought with Robert Lee during the Seven Days Battles of the Peninsula Campaign in 1862. On July 1st, in the early afternoon, one of the war's most powerful artillery barrages occurred. In the midst of the barrages, Holmes stepped from his cabin, cupping his ear, and said cautiously, I thought I heard firing. Holmes was absolutely caught off guard due to his poor hearing. Holmes had a talent for lingering on the sidelines and making excuses not to attack, like he did at Malvern Hill. In his following position with the Trans-Mississippi Department, he failed to safeguard the Mississippi River outposts and refused to reinforce Vicksburg. Major General Daniel Sickles. Sickles's military career began as Colonel of the 70th New York Infantry. In November 1862, he received a promotion to Major General. During the Battle of Gettysburg, he completely ignored Major General George Meade's direct orders. Sickles's orders were to cover the round tops on the Union's left flank, but he instead sent his soldiers to the Peach Orchard. As a result, the Third Corps was defeated and forced off the battlefield. During the incident, Sickles lost his right leg. Despite this catastrophe, Sickles received the Medal of Honor for his actions at Gettysburg. Not only was he a horrible general, but he was also a terrible person. Let us recall a few events from his miserable life. Married an underage girl half his age against her parents' wishes. He had sex with prostitutes while his wife was pregnant. He murdered his wife's lover. Was a political appointee who had no military experience. Snubbed Queen Victoria while in military uniform in London. He pretended to be a hero despite his failure at Gettysburg. Major General Braxton Bragg. Braxton Bragg was definitely the Confederacy's worst general. Bragg, in supreme command of the Confederacy's Western troops, was responsible for several costly Southern defeats and the loss of thousands of men. His ideas were frequently meaningless, and he had no understanding of what campaigning was all about or even where his battles were headed. 
Bragg usually lost focus right before or after a fighting, leaving his subordinates to figure out what they were supposed to achieve. Under Bragg, the army won some battles at Perryville, Stones River, and Chickamauga, but never delivered the final blow. This issue had been made worse by Bragg's inability to interact with people. Braxton Bragg's behavior and body language have been described as that of a cornered animal. Bragg was described by his subordinates as vindictive, contrary, and deceitful. As a result, he discovered that his orders were practically never followed properly. He had almost no friends except the one who mattered most, President Jefferson Davis. When everyone else had had enough of Bragg's argumentative and carping behavior, Davis always stood by his pal. After Bragg's defeat at Chattanooga in November 1863, Davis accepted his resignation as army commander. However, Bragg remained involved in the Confederate Army throughout the war, serving as President Davis's military advisor, Major General George McClellan. Until World War II, George McClellan was without a doubt the greatest organizer and commander of military operations in the American Army. However, as a battlefield leader, McClellan was absolutely unsuccessful. McClellan always had solid ideas. He just lacked the motivation and ability to carry them out. He hated seeing his soldiers murdered or injured. He couldn't bear to see his magnificent instrument destroyed. He retreated from war and physically left the fields where his soldiers were fighting. Because of his reluctance to fight, he believed reports that he was outnumbered. This developed a near-paralyzing sense of caution. When his preparations failed, he blamed everyone, the War Department, Lincoln, and Stanton. During the anti etam campaign, he had the potential to end the war in the Eastern Theater, but he was unable to overcome his hesitation to lead the army into battle. McClellan lacked commitment in the attack, while in defense, he merely searched for an escape route. Lee's reputation was established on George McClellan's inability to resolve issues. Don't forget to subscribe and press likes.